Today we have a the second of four uh, co-writers of the book, Four Colored Girls Who Considered Politics. Uh, her, she is Mignon Moore. Good, uh, how you doing, Mignon? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Happy New Year. I'm glad to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, yes. 2018 was a great year uh, for women in politics, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 2019 and 20 a great year, too. Yes, I, absolutely. I was just... Uh, I was doing some research last night and I pulled up an article from back in November, an updated article by Samantha Cooney on the Time magazine. And she was just laying down all the uh, seats in Congress and governors and everything. And I noticed a lot of them was in the South, like uh, Marsha Blackburn and uh, what uh, the, the woman out of uh, Georgia was able to do. Mm -hmm. And my first question is, do you, do you think that uh, more states in the South will, will become uh, blue in the future? Well, we certainly hope so. We hope we hope that what um, Andrew Gilliam and Stacey Abrams was able to accomplish, we hope that's laying the groundwork. I mean, you know, if you look at the statistics, uh, certainly for African Americans and now for people of color, more and more you find that we're moving back south. And so I think if we concentrate on our vote and continue to concentrate on our power, yeah, we'll have, I think we'll have more electeds. I mean, you know, right now we have a new wave of governors, of course. Uh, I mean, not governors, a new wave of mayors in the South. You know, you have, you know, Mayor Walker out of Charlottesville, Virginia. You have Steve Benjamin in South Carolina and so forth. So, you know, Keisha Bottom in Atlanta. So hopefully we can continue that trend. Mm. Uh, I was having I, one of my uh, one of my clients. He's a uh, recording artist. He he made a post because his mom is a government worker, and he said uh, this shutdown, like our president is uh, being a, like basically being a like a brat. Mm -hmm. And my question was, um, he started talking about. Uh, I was telling him like voting is important and all that. And one person said voting doesn't count. And he and then someone brought up about uh, uh, felons not being able to vote. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading something about, um, you know, a lot of states are starting to s switch that around. Right. Um, can I get a, can you just give us a little bit of knowledge of the process and what's actually happening? Well, you fi you're finding that it's becoming a trend. You're talking about felons getting their rights restored. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I mean, if you look at uh, Terry McAuliffe in Virginia, he actually, st he was one of the first to start the trend. And he restored the rights of uh, felons to get their voting rights, and now it's happening in Florida. I think you got over 1.3 million people that are now eligible to vote. And so I think it's important because, you know, when people say, you know, and you hear this all the time, you know, why should I vote? What's the, what's the purpose of voting? And I think if you just, you know, if you just stop and take a look at what's happening in this country today and you take a look at what's happening in your own neighborhoods, then you will say, okay, this, when you see, there's no job in America other than a politician that gets off with just bloody doing nothing if you don't think they do anything. You know, people have to keep in mind that these are your taxpayer dollars. Or, and even if you're not a taxpayer and your parents are a taxpayer or some member of your family is a taxpayer, you're hiring these people to do a job. You don't hire them and then walk away and say, oh, Okay, they didn't do what I said they were supposed. They didn't do what they said they were supposed to do. You got to hold them accountable, just like you hold everybody else accountable. But no, we give them the job. We get all emotional about it. We let them get in office, and then when they don't do anything, then we get upset and say, "Oh, well, my vote doesn't count." Well, you just got to keep up with them, and you got to make sure you got to stay in their face, just like anybody else. I mean, if you were an employer, you you're not going to hire anybody and just say, "Okay, go for it." That's not how it works. And that's not how it works with your tax dollars either. Absolutely. Um, this past election, um, I love I love following your, uh, you on social media because you give so much information away. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember you put some statistics down about uh, Stacey Abrams' campaign, and it showed a, a lot of men just didn't vote or didn't vote for her. Period. Mm -hmm. And my question is, why do you, why do you why is why are women judged different when it comes to positions in of power or positions in politics? Why what are some of those reasons you think? You know, you 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 know, I see. I think that is probably 
the question that we will have to answer going forward, because we will have so many women mm -hmm. certainly running for uh, for president, but I don't think that there is any really clear answer other than the fact that, you know, in this country, while we are used to women being in, you know, positions, we are used to them being in authority, we we for some reason can't see them either in the number one position or in the position to have to, you know, tell tell you, not necessarily what to do, but tell you their vision. And so I think part of it's because we haven't really shaped a narrative or a message around women leaders. And so when they get out here, you know, we're constantly you know, constantly treading water. And then I think the other part of it, which is hurt, I think hurt not only her, because they, they, they used her as the whipping stick against mm -hmm. women. I think the way people have portrayed Hillary Clinton, that has also given people license to just talk about women in some of the most bastardly ways, and it's gone unchallenged. And I'm hoping that we spend a lot more time normalizing the conversation around women, you know, so that so that men, quite frankly, won't feel threatened when they get in office, because our job is not to get in office to dismiss you. Our job is to get in office just like you, to run the vision that we believe is good for a state or a country. And so if we can invest our time and money in you, we're hoping that men can see that this is not a power play. This is, I mean, you know, people run for office because they want to, they have a vision. They want to change things. They don't just run for office because they're looking for power. And that's particularly important to note for women. That's not normally why we get in office. We really do believe we can change things. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I was having a hard time finding out how credible this fact was, but I was reading somewhere and I was looking at videos and social media and everything. They were saying the person, the guy that Stacey Abrams ran against actually ran the committee or something like that? No, he was Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And what that simply means is, you know, if you remember Gore versus Bush, mm -hmm. if you remember Catherine Harris, okay. she was the one that controlled the levers of the voting booth. She was the one that controlled whether you had ballots on time or whether you didn't have ballots on time. She was the one that controlled whether the ballots looked like a, chain, uh, a hanging chad or a real ballot. And so people don't understand when you have a secretary of state, that person actually can say, just like he did in Stacey's instance, 53,000 people can be null and void. Wow. And that's who that guy was. And then she had, to, she had to go to court in order to get that overturned so those folks' votes could count. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that when people are thinking about these when they, you know, I know one of your questions was about state and local elected officials. Mm -hmm. When they think about elections, they should also make sure they are not passing over that secretary of state if it's an elected position on their ballots. That's, that's thank you. That was deep. <laughs> Excuse me, I had a pause. Mm -hmm. um, why do? You, why is it so important for us to update these election laws? And I just want to, I, I just want to give the uh, the people the information on just on that process alone. Well, it's important because systematically we have voter suppression, we have people, we have young people moving all the time, and a lot of these laws actually, they actually hurt, especially young students, mm -hmm. because, you know, Reverend Jackson used to have this theory, you vote where you live, and most of these kids are in school doing voting time, and they are not able to vote, so... So you, well, that's one reason why you have to make sure the laws are reflective of, what, you know, of your population. And I think the Voting Rights Act has been gutted. And yeah. so we don't have the same protections we used to have. That's why you have voter intimidation, and that's why you're, you know, you, you're finding that we have to go to the polls with all these different IDs. Yeah. And I say if that's what it takes to vote, take three or four IDs. Take your phone bill, oh, take your right. light bill, take whatever bill you have to take that's got your name on it. But don't let these people systematically tell you you can't vote. But that's one of the other reasons why we've got to update these laws, because they're arcane, and it makes it more difficult for people, fair-minded people, to vote. I mean, look at the military. I mean, if you don't get an absentee ballot, you're just out. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. What are, um, what are some goals, what, what are some things that the party can do better to prepare for 2021? 
You know, one of the things that I, I noticed when we were out here on this book tour, Oz, was that people, and I, I say this is a opportunity and probably a failure of the party, mm-hmm. the opportunity is that people are yearning to get involved. They want to get involved. But you have to you have to almost demystify this and make sure that they know that they can do it from where they live, where they where they sleep, where they go to church, where they go to school. But if we make politics look so big and untouchable all the time, then it just turns people off. And I think we have stopped inviting people to participate. You know, we've stopped giving room for them to come in on a grassroots level and say, hey, you got a phone bank going on tonight for this candidate. I want to be involved. And so, you know, I'm encouraging, even when I'm talking to these candidates now, invite citizens in to participate with you because they want to help. I mean, they don't necessarily want a title. They want to help. They want to knock on doors. They really want to figure out how they can get the right people in office. And while they are thinking like that, we have to reopen this process and make it accessible to them. And, you know, people skip over their mayors. They skip over their state and local elected officials. I say pay attention to those folks because they're they're the ones that's actually controlling where you live at home. Yeah, Yeah, that's 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 so true. Um, I was I was actually reading about a. about speaking of the mayors, uh, excuse me, about the, uh, the another female holding a position that uh, making history was Tish James. And I was yeah. telling Ms. Dar- Ms. Daughtry yesterday a story. I actually worked on her campaign when she was running for public advocate. Oh, wow. And one of the things that stood out with me, with her, and I worked with other uh, people locally too, but one thing that stood out with me on an eight hour shift, she actually came with us for about six and a half hours. Wow. Actually just meeting people from all different social classes from Jamaica, South Jamaica, to uh, to all the way to 40 projects and, and, and Southside Queens. And my question is, um, how important it is for again to just piggyback on how important it is for for these candidates to actually touch and get be closer to the people as opposed to them coming the candidates. I mean, the voters coming to them. Oh, absolutely, 100% important. I mean, the fact that she was, I mean, that's quite impressive, and that's probably the reason why she's the New York York Attorney General, Mm -hmm. because she was able to reach people, and she did build up a base for herself. It's not either or, it's both and. You know, you want the you want the citizens to come along on this journey with you, but you have to be willing to go along on the journey with them too. Absolutely. I think one of the drawbacks of what's happened in campaigns, quite frankly, is that technology has supplanted actual, you know, touching and really interacting with voters as much as we should. Mm-hmm. And so I say it's gotta be high touch and high tech. Absolutely. And you got, and these candidates have to spend a lot more time, you know, really introducing themselves to to regular voters because people are a lot more sophisticated. They're a lot more skeptical, and you got to make believers out of them. And so, you know, I applaud her for sp- spending six and a half hours out there because you know that's what that's what the average citizen does on her behalf. Yeah, that's true. I looked at it like that. Is it just to shift gears a tiny bit? Um, mm-hmm. Is 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 this uh, is immigration in these DACA things? Is that is it is it complex or is it really just you know our commander in chief just being stubborn? Is it a complex issue? Immigration has always been I wouldn't call it a complex issue. I think that this has always been an issue that we have wrestled with how you deal with it in a and I call it in a humane bucket. Mm-hmm. You know, America has always welcomed in immigrants to this country. We have always welcomed. You know, people from different racial backgrounds, religions, you name it. We welcomed it. And now we are putting these roadblocks up. It's not even the roadblocks as much as the language. Yes, I mean, the language has become so toxic and so unwelcoming and so, I think, just so barbaric until it just it just really makes us look like we are a country that has just lost its compassion. Do we need a... Do we need a fair and just immigration policy? Absolutely. Do we need to make sure people are coming in legally? Absolutely. I would think that most of the immigrants in this country believe that as well. But do they need to be 
looked down upon and made to, you know, inventing all these all these reasons why they can't come, rapists, murderers, and I mean, who talks like that? Yeah. And you're supposed to be a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's just it, and by the way, on immigration, you know, you you go back and look at the statistics. Immigration is not because somebody is coming across the border. Immigration is because somebody has come in this country legally, and their visa has expired, and they stay in. Oh, got you. That's a good point. I never even looked at it like that. That's wow. And and I and I think sometimes he doesn't even think about the student visas and like because I went to school at a HBCU, and like. The, the Caribbean population literally bought our GPS, GPA up as a school as a whole. Oh, I bet. So a lot of times it's just put out there like they're not being productive or he's just highlighting all of the non-productive people. And I'm willing to bet that there's more productive immigrants than there are non-productive immigrants in this country. We know all of this is hyperbole. Mm -hmm. And we know we all have friends. I mean, at some level, whether you're a slave or an immigrant, we've all come through some 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 channel in America. Mm -hmm. America is just built that way. Nobody was the first here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't claim America like that. And that's why I think it's important that we get back to our sensibilities and start acting like we are a welcoming country. Because listen, if you took the immigrants out of the out of the population, gosh, half the country would be shut down. <laughs> you think the government is shut down? It's it's um it's. Does immigration uh, affect different states and cities different to you, or is just you think it's just one, you know? Well, obviously, California, you know, that's probably a place where you have to look. Texas is a place that probably, you know, as if you're focused on what he's talking about, Florida, those places. But no, I mean, listen, you, you know, it's like it's like you say. People look at immigration as though it's just a you know a Hispanic issue. No, it's a it's a Caribbean issue. Mm -hmm. It is a European issue. And so, you know, his wife is an immigrant, for God's sake. His <laughs> ex-wife is an immigrant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just uh, just a, on a lighter note, uh, you know, you and your team are people that obviously you know dedicated your life to service and politics. My question is, what 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 do you what do you do in your downtime? Well, you know what I do <laughs> <laughs> for the audience. Right. Well, I still dibble and dabble in film, but I don't have a camera. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an inside joke, guy. <laughs> Can I tell them that? Can I tell them? Yeah, you can. Go right ahead. I went to film school with Mignon, <laughs> and um, one of the things I always appreciated about you is like you you embraced us and you made us have this sense of family. And you, and you made sure we was nurtured right because we weren't in the majority. Right. And a lot of those people, like I still do business with Angela. Angela's actually a business partner and my friend and my family now. Brian is like family to me now. And um, you put us in environments and, and really showed us that it could happen. So I just, uh, I just again, I, I don't want to sound goofy, but I really do appreciate you in the, in the way you put us in that position so we could believe that it can happen. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I listen, I live vicariously through you, Brian and, and Angela, <laughs> and I think the sentiment is absolutely the same for me, too, because I enjoy working with you guys, I enjoy learning from you, y'all kept me young while I was in school, so I am all for the cohorts, um, yes. I, but I still, I still do um, dib dibble and dabble, I'm still trying to work on a script, I'm actually looking at doing something slightly different in terms of, you know, this 220 election, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you a little bit more about it as I finish flushing it out. But my passion is, and probably still will be for a long time, is to tackle uh, the film and TV industry, because I really do believe, Oz, that part of the challenge, and it goes back to one of your first questions about how women are perceived, mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge is if we see, if we don't see ourselves, we don't, it's hard to dream it or imagine it. Now you can see, you know, you can see Claire Underwood on House of Cards. Mm -hmm. That is really not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about seeing consistent images, especially of black and brown people. Absolutely. That can help elevate how young people look at us, mm -hmm. how young people look at themselves. And I'm saying let us find the balance. I ain't saying take, you know, take Game of Thrones off TV or any of the things that, you know, people might love to look at. I'm saying give us more balance so that people can imagine yeah. 
what they can be. And that's what, you know, I'll continue to focus on it. So I'll I'll keep pushing my filmmaker friends until I can push through that, you know, push through that other barricade of theirs. I I, I, I will tell one more story. I remember um, when we were in school, you took us to uh, uh, Miss Barry's house for the birthday party. Uh-huh. And when I was in that backyard, I just remember laughing at, uh, with Angela and Brian. Like, I can't believe all these people are sitting here like it's regular, like it's normal. <laughs> it was <And> normal. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, Kathy Hughes is someone, Drew, since then I've been studying Kathy Hughes a lot. And just her come up and the way she do it is a big inspiration for me. So I just felt like it was, it was significant to bring that up just now. Yeah, we're going to go. Uh, we're going to get back together. We have some things we have to do. <laughs> And Eric Michael Dyson, I met mm-hmm. Vivica Fox, cause a lot of people, man, and I just, I remember um, when Barack was running, a lot of people were saying, this needs to happen because kids need to see it. And I didn't quite understand it then until it happened to, like, to, until I made that correlation, like, yo, I mm-hmm. needed to see that happen. So, and um, going back to your earlier days in politics, when you were first starting off, who, who, who helped you the most? Um... I would say this woman named Reverend Willie Taplin Barrow. Mm-hmm. She was my, um, she was partly my inspiration, but she was also partly my entry point into high-level politics. I, I used to laugh at this, and I tell young people this all the time. A lot of times you don't have to have a title. A lot of times you just want to be in the room. Mm-hmm. You want to be in the room so that you can listen and learn. And she used to take me to a lot of these high-level meetings when Mayor Harold Washington mm-hmm. was running for office. And I would be listening to them, and I guess this stuff was just starting to penetrate in my soul. Mm-hmm. And I was basically just sitting in a corner holding her purse, and I was happy to hold the purse because <laughs> I was like, huh, I bet ain't nobody else sitting up in here listening to all these. I mean, you had every leader in Chicago in these rooms. And so that's kind of where I started. But it gave what it did was it, um, it gave me the courage to actually start working on his campaign. Mm. So I marched myself down to his office with a couple of friends of mine, and we decided we wanted to volunteer and help him with his youth organizing. So we said, well, who's in charge of that? They say, you all are. Mm. And that's how we really started getting involved, because we wanted to volunteer. We wanted to participate. And we actually did a great job for him, and he knew we did a great job. We worked our tails off. But did nobody tell us? Did nobody say, hey, you know, you you need to get out the way. And I wasn't out there telling Reverend Barrow she was too old to be doing this. I was like, okay, what is it that I can do? And I think so often what we what happens with young people is they decide that they can't get involved because somebody else is in the way. If you look up, I can tell you this: the leadership line is short. You can get in it, or you can take it over, or you can get to the front. It does not matter. Ain't nobody blocking you. It's in your mind. That's real. That is real. Um, yes, when I, when I got a chance to interview, interview Ms. Daughtry yesterday, mm-hmm. she talked about the, uh, the Reverend Jackson campaign in 84 and 88, mm-hmm. and she said, uh, she, something she said on Breakfast Club and on this show, she said, um, we were able to get in the rooms we didn't even know existed. Oh, absolutely. So, like, like how, how, how surreal was that in the actual moment? It was way for real. Listen, right there in New York... I was sent in to work on Reverend Jackson's campaign, mm. and I was to report to this man named Bill Lynch. Mm. You might know him, and you might not know him, but he was uh, David Dinkins' deputy chief of staff when he became mayor. Mm-hmm. And Bill was one of the best organizers in the state and, everybody, and mostly sought after. So when I got there, they were all in a high-level meeting. It was Bill Lynch, Percy Sutton, um, Basil Ta- ba- Basil Patterson, I mean, you name it. You know, it was Carl McCall, all all the big boys, Dennis Rivera, all of them. So he came out. I guess he must have came out for a little break. And so the receptionist said, well, Mignon, Mignon Moore is here to see you. And so he kind of looked at me and looked down, you know, because he was like, but he was Bill Lynch, and he was like, what is this girl think she's going to do here <laughs> in New York? And so I said, well, sir, I'm here to help help on the Jackson campaign. <laughs> oh, God, that was just like a joke to him. Mm-hmm. He told me to just sit down. <laughs> so I said, I, I literally, as I sat in that office, I sat in that waiting room for almost six hours waiting for that meeting to end. Mm-hmm. And he finally came out. And he basically told me, if you're here to F up our politics in this state, you can go <laughs> home right now. And I said, well, no, sir, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm, I'm here to help. 
And he said, well, I think I'm going to keep you just because you decided you wasn't going to move for six hours. Yeah, <laughs> well, wow, what that's else real. was I supposed to do? <laughs> You're very right. passionate when you speak on, on politics. So I know this is this is something that just, like, you. it, it found you in a lot of ways, didn't it? Or did yep. you find it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I definitely walked into it. It didn't. I, di- I didn't seek it, man. I, I certainly did not seek this. It was something that just kind of, you know, after being around it so much and being around the right people, and, you know, Reverend Jackson, of course, was very instrumental in, in my career. I mean, I would have never worked at the White House had it not been for my ability to actually learn and get into these rooms because of him. Got you, got you. What a... Um I was uh, yesterday. Miss Darcy was uh, told me about some grassroots organizations I, I had no idea existed. One in mm-hmm. particular was by uh, she said, "Black Black voter Black votes matter." Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, Black votes matter. Um, no, uh, Natasha. She mentioned someone, but she the the topic was more, more or less on grassroots organizations out there that we probably won't even get to know about, but they're actually doing a lot of good work. Could you just talk to us about? Some grassroots uh, organizations in the South and in the North that's kind of. Doing oh, she's t- oh, I, I yeah, it, it probably is called Black Votes. It's probably yeah, Black Votes Matter. It's it's probably one of the organizations that was instrumental in electing Senator Jones. Hmm. And so that's that's one of them. But you also have like in everybody in their own neighborhood. All you have to do is Google. All you have to do is say put in your Google search organizations that work on either civic engagement, voting, or in particular, if you're interested in, you know, just black voting, all you got to do is put in whatever state you're in. You know, if you want to just go to a Democratic Party route, you can always go down to the Democratic office, and hopefully they will have a welcoming arm and welcoming doors. But a lot of these, a lot of these elected officials also have organizations that they're working on and that, that that have become a pride and joy to them. So if you, like, for example, uh, Stacy now has founded an organization, I think it's called Fight, 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 Fight for the Right or something like that. So that's, in, that's happening in Georgia. She's going to be going around the country, you know, raising money for it because one of the things that she was obviously impacted by was voter suppression. Mm-hmm. And voter, you know, not voter turnout as much, but voter suppression. So she's going to be raising and highlighting that issue. She did and a so, lot before that, before she was selected to register voters, right? You said what? She did a lot of groundwork before she oh, even got on the ballot. She really, um, I think, in terms of modern day campaigns, she really laid the groundwork for how you really do, I think, a modern day campaign. Mm-hmm. And she had, she had spent an incredible amount of time years ramping up to that registering voters in places and pockets where people didn't even think about Mm -hmm. going and so that became her base and i i declare to you had not some of those votes been stolen for her you would be calling her governor abrams yeah i heard the story all the way from um new york so i know she was making real noise oh yeah she was doing real things um uh, Oswald, this is Oswald Williams. You're watching Random but Relevant, presented by My Block TV. We're here with Mignon Moore, Mignon Moore, excuse me, the co-writer of Four Col- Color Girls Who Consider Politics. Um, I got one more intense one for you, uh, Mignon. Okay. I'm having a hard time finding real credible information on the First Step Act, but what I can tell you, there was a there was a senator out of uh, Texas who was introducing it, and he was real proud that it was a faith-based bipartisan bill. But a lot of times, no one talks about it. And I just wanted to, like, where do, where do young kids go to find credible information about these, uh, these laws being passed? Well, first of all, this goes back to my fundamental point that I started off with. You have to stay connected to your local elected officials. Mm-hmm. If you find that there is a bill that is being passed in Congress in particular, and you don't know who represents you in your particular area, Mm -hmm. and you have never picked up the phone and said, Senator so-and-so or Congressman, they all have constituency offices, Mm -hmm. and those offices are there to help explain what is happening here in Congress. So if there is a bill that you are interested in knowing anything about, then 
make sure you understand who your congressional members are and who your senators are, because that is your first point of contact to helping to understand some of these bills. And that is their job. They're supposed to be giving you information on this stuff. And maybe you can become their ambassador if you, you know, if you start connecting to them in the right way. But always start with them. And if that doesn't work, then you should call the sponsor of the bill. You should call that office. Okay. And I will uh, I will text you numbers that you can call if you're ever looking for. I mean, you know, there are central numbers you can call for mm-hmm. Congress. There's obviously central numbers you can call for the White House when you're protesting. <laughs> there are central numbers you can call for your senator. But there are numbers that you should be using that are congressional offices in your own backyard. And please be sure and take the time to do that. Absolutely. Especially for, you know, things that are important to our community. Mm -hmm. You're really like you, you, you're really like a behind the scenes person when it comes to working in the field. What made you guys come together and do the book? Um, I think a number of things, you know, and I don't know if Leah had spent any time talking about it uh, yesterday, but one of the things that was happening around us was that we were getting some overtures for, from some people out in Hollywood to do a, to do a, um, what do you call it, a series on us. Mm. And so, you know, we thought about it, and, you know, we didn't really put too much, too much heart to it, but the person that was uh, asking us to think about it was a good friend of ours, and she was a you know, prolific showrunner out in, in Hollywood. So we started the process, and but we started looking at the script, and while she is an incredible writer, and probably for any other group of women, that probably would have been a, a bang-up script. Mm. But I think for us, because we still live and breathe this, this stuff, we didn't want, you know, because we had, they were certain things written about us that were not true, but mm. this but the series was going to be based on our likeness, and we just decided that we probably need to stop and actually put down who we are first. Yeah, and true. then, you know, if they decide to go off and do a work of fiction, fine. At least people will know, well, you know, she didn't really do that. You know, she didn't really give away no secrets in the White <laughs> House. Now, they might do it now, mm-hmm. but I wasn't giving away no secrets, although the script had me giving away secrets. So <laughs> we just, you know, we just we took a step back. And that's, ca- that's kind of how we came to the book. And, you know, our friend, one of our friends told us that, you know, you guys really need to think about your history and make sure it's reflected appropriately because you are, some of our next leaders you know so that's how we got there awesome last question before we sign off Mm -hmm. i think i remember we i asked you about this we talked on this briefly before um i remember when hillary clinton was running and i got a chance to see her at hofstra university Mm -hmm. and and, um i remember a bill she had introduced and then i remember obama when obama first laid out his idea for obamacare it was very similar did they work together on that bill well they had some of the same people working on the bill and they had the same i think they had the same idea about health care mm-hmm. that help everyone should have access to health care so they fundamentally started from that premise and one of the young women who was the architect of some of uh, our ideas also worked for President Obama, so I'm not a bit surprised that you didn't see some of the similarities. Mm. But he also, of course, had you know some ideas of his own. But you know, she, you know, as, as I like to say, she took all the whippings for the health care bill, yeah. and he was able to get it passed. Mm-hmm. Did we um did we get spoiled with the, the how articulate Obama is? Did we get spoiled now that we're in this position we're in now? When you say spoiled, what do you mean? I mean like the wording. Uh, this our president uses now. I just seen like Obama was a little bit more articulate, like like kind of like Bill Clinton was when I was in a teenager. He knew yeah. how to speak to you and make you feel like. Well, he was first part of all, of President Obama was a man of great dignity mm-hmm. and great respect for himself, and he understood the images he transmitted not just to America but to the world. Mm-hmm. And he was very clear on that. He and his wife both were very clear on that. And they probably lived eight years through a prism mm. of not trying to do anything that would embarrass this country or themselves or our people. I don't think what we have now really cares, frankly. 
And unfortunately, what is being impacted us is the next generation. Yeah. Because, you know, we're, we will be fine in many regards, but it's this next generation that we're helping to shape their minds right now. And, and I can tell you, if, we, if they don't have parents at home or if they don't have people that are talking to them every day about what is happening and some of the, you know, some of the toxicity in this country, then we could be setting ourselves up for another, you know, another set of people that are just disliking each other, yeah. which is really a, a great fear of mine. I just think we're not giving these young people a chance. But thank God they're smarter than we are. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. And, and they're activists, and they're trying to fight against some of this stuff, too. Yeah. Um, once again, I'm a Mignon. It was always a pleasure talking to you. You know, I always send you a text when I need some information and everything, and I appreciate you. Sure. Um, this is Random But Relevant, presented by My Block TV. I'm your host, Oswald Williams. We want to thank Mignon Moore, co-author of Four Color Girls Who Consider Politics, for joining us. Um, don't forget to check us out every Tuesday at 5.30, every Saturday at 7.30 exclusively on QP TV Channel 79 or 1998 if you prefer HD. Um, don't forget to check out our YouTube page on the back end of the show. Once again, and buy the book. And buy the book. We will have the details and the link on the YouTube page as well. Mignon, thank you again. Four Color Girls Who Consider Politics, available on all platforms. And you can get the um, you can get this on Kindle too, right? Yep, absolutely. Yes. Yes, don't forget to get it, guys. Have a good night. Your host, Oswald Williams. Good night, everybody. Thank you.